Yeah, trước hết, Thiên Hương xin cảm ơn uh, trường đại học tiểu bang Oregon, uh, giáo sư Tường Vũ và lại trung tâm uh, Mỹ Việt Nam học uh, có mỗi cơ hội để tham gia trong cái hội nghi này. Um, first of all, I, my name is Thiên Hương Ninh, and um, I just want to thank uh, University of Oregon, uh, Professor uh, Tường Vũ, and the U.S. Vietnam Center for the, this opportunity to be here, participate in this conference. Um, I've attended many, many conference, uh, conferences, uh, but this one really stands out for me because it's really grounded in the spirit in service of our Vietnamese community in the diaspora. So it's really touching for me uh, to be able to participate in it and be connected to all of you here. Uh, so um, our panel is on religion, as you can see here, and our panelists uh, will uh, talk about three main religions among Vietnamese in the diaspora. Uh, we'll start out with uh, presentations on Catholicism, followed by presentation on Gao Dai, and then on Buddhism. And so the three questions that we aim to uh, explore, to, uh, to answer, includes trying to understand how religion is uh, a way in which our Vietnamese community in the diaspora tried to rebuild itself, uh, especially after, of course, uh, 1975. Another issue that really came out in our discussion uh, as a group is that, uh, you know, what about the younger generation? You know, how is religion or can religion be a way for them to be connected to our community uh, and construct, be engaged in constructing the Vietnamese uh, identity in a diaspora? And then uh, last but not least is to look at how religious groups actually mobilize across re religious differences to build a sense of communities. And, and so that's why I, I you know, our panel here really aim to represent that. As you can see, there are three main religious uh, groups here, uh, or at least presentations on three main religious groups here. Okay, so um, I'd like to just share a little bit of my research uh, as a way of opening up the panel. Uh, so I'll talk about the Vietnamese Catholic communities across the borders. Uh, religion is something that uh, I've studied uh, for almost 20 years, so it's really a near and dear topic to my heart. Uh, so I'd like to start out with this picture right here. Um, and it's a picture of my family, and uh, guess who, uh, so th I, I am in there, I'm just wondering if you know which one it is. Mm. Yeah, but there are two of them in yellow. <laughs> Can, <laughs> there's only one. <laughs> huh? Huh? Either one? I'll give you a hint, I'm wearing the, the same color right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's me. Um, right there so i was uh i just turned nine and so this is the first photo that we took when we landed uh, as sfo uh so um my uh so the other so my family includes uh, six children and then my parents and then the other folks are uh my uh the, the family that sponsored us so we when we arrived i was just like so surprised that stairs moved Do doors open for you when you come close to the doors. And I was just so surprised by that. And so I asked my parents at that time, oh my gosh, how, how did this occur? And they told me that doors and stairs here have noses. And I actually believe in that. I said, oh my God, that is amazing. But I share that story because that's to show you how innocent I was, you know, our, our humble beginnings. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Vietnam uh, and spent some time in Binh Hoa to go to school. Uh, so we were very simple, and we were able to come to the United States through Hat O, um, uh, the uh, humanitarian order uh, program. So we were group number seven. My dad was in prison for about 10 years, uh, and so that's uh, because of that we were able to come to the United States. Uh, so I, even though I'm a product of the Vietnam War, I never really knew much about it. My parents didn't really talk about it, and I think this is a theme that some of us kind of touched upon already. And so then I've always been curious about what happened in the past, right, uh, with the war in Vietnam, uh, as someone who is a product of that war. And so I had a chance to explore that further in when I was a student, uh, so I had to do research, a uh, research project. And so I, um, I, I decided to study uh, Our Lady of Lavang because I saw statues of her everywhere. Uh, and um, I was living in LA at that time, and I, I saw a lot of statues of Our Lady Guadalupe. And there were a lot of publications on her, but I didn't see a lot of publications on Aule Lavang. So has anyone seen her? I'm just curious. Yeah, some of you have? Yeah, I'm sure, right? But again, at that time, so this is like around almost 20 years ago, there was hardly any publications on her. So I was just curious, you know, what's going on here? So I, uh, 
I decided to research her, and I found several uh, interesting things. Okay, first, she appeared uh, in Vietnam in La Vang, uh, right there, as you can see, near the DMZ zone, in 1798. Uh, and according to oral traditions, she appeared to refugees, uh, those who were fleeing from religious persecution from Hue, because uh, at that time, the emperor was, uh, the capital was based there. Uh, and so they were fleeing from persecution, and she appeared to comfort them. So again, this happened in, in about 1798. So um, Catholicism at that time was not tolerated. Uh, that's why um, Vietnamese Catholics were refugees. Um, and so in, at the turn of the century, uh, due to French colonialism, uh, French control over Vietnamese society, Catholicism became much more tolerated and in some ways supported uh, by the French government. And so uh, this statue here, as you can see, is Our Lady of Victories, actually. It was used to represent Our Lady Lavang, yeah, Đức Mẹ Lavang, right? So uh, that's her image between 1901 and 1997, so almost 100 years. This is how she looked like, okay? Now, I was surprised that she has a huge makeover in 1990. I mean, like, almost 100%, right? Completely different in that, by 1998, right? Completely different. So now, as you can see, she, uh, she's right here. She has black hair. She's wearing Ao Yai, right? Very, very Vietnamese, right? So then here I was a student. I was like, okay, what happened then? And so when I asked people in the community, they said, oh no, she's always like that. She's our mother. Of course she looks like that. And I was like, really? Are you sure? Uh, and so I was really confused by that. Uh, so I, I decided to do research into this uh, further. And then I found out that what's interesting is that she was Asianized or Vietnamized in the diaspora. You know, specifically with the Vietnamese Catholic uh, community in Orange County, uh, which is the largest community outside of, of Vietnam. So they actually mobilized for this effort to Vietnamize her. Because one may think that, oh, she was probably Vietnamized by Vietnamese Catholics in Vietnam. But again, that wasn't the case. She was Vietnamized in the diaspora, right? So again, that's another surprise for me, right? Not only that she changed her face, right? She's Vietnamized, she was actually Vietnamized in the US, right? Shocking for me. And so, and what I found interesting, this image now, and perhaps that's why some of you have already seen her, is actually all over the world now. And that's part of my research. So she was uh, Vietnamized in the US, okay? okay? Export to La Vang, Vietnam, because that's where La Vang is, all right? So after US Vietnam normalized relations, uh, you know, Viet, you know, Vietnamese Americans were able to have contact with Vietnam, and so they decided to export that image to, Viet, to La Vang, and La Vang said, okay, we'll accept her, right? And then once uh, that was, uh, uh, once um, the church in Vietnam accepted her in an image of a Vietnamese woman, that image then was exported to all over the world, right? All over the world, and I'm just gonna show you some in images of that. Uh, so for instance, you may not, it's kind of hard to see it from here, but this is actually a couple from Germany who attended a ceremony in Santa Ana to receive one of these statues of Duc Mat Lavang. So these, there were actually five statues for our, our, uh, our in, in the picture. Uh, one went to uh, Asia, one went to Europe, or Germany in this case. Uh, so there were a the couple who uh, represented um, uh, the Europeans, uh, Vietnamese in Europe. Uh, one went to the US, one went to Canada, and one went to Australia. Okay? And all five statues were, were, had already been blasted by Pope John Paul II. Okay? And so these statues now um, migrate. Okay? So like each community will take turn to, to take care of the uh, this statue that has been, again, blessed by Pope, Pope John Paul II. So in Germany, um, so I, I did uh, uh, some ethnographic work in Germany, so every year they would come together, and this is when they would uh, display the statue of Our Lady Lavang. Um, and uh, right here, this uh, it's probably hard to tell, but this is actually, I took this picture actually in Japan, and if can someone read this, can someone read this for me? If someone's sitting in the front, maybe Professor Tuan Huang. <laughs> Uh, that's right, right? So uh, Our Lady Lavang is not only, as you can see, important for Vietnamese Catholics, but also in this case, Filipino Catholics as well. And can you take a guess what percentage of Filipinos are Catholics? Pretty high, right? 90%. But they had to borrow the Vietnamese 
you know, Virgin Mary to represent right, their local faith. You can see that? So I found that very, really interesting. And then, of course, now there are you know, um, all kinds of events around Our Lady Lavang all over the world ever since she became Vietnamized. Again, that occurred only in 1998. Uh, so that's, what, approximately 30 years only, right? So Marion Day is huge in Missouri. Uh, I think that's the largest Vietnamese festival I've ever attended. Uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, of thousands of Vietnamese around the world and across two borders, coast to coast, meet in the middle in this tiny city of only 15,000 people. But that day, of course, overwhelming me. Um, you know, overwhelm the population uh, and the, the local population and the hotels or accommodation that could not accommodate all the visitors, right? So it's huge and it's uh, for about a week. And I knew, when I was there, I was able to talk to not only Vietnamese Catholics, but just Vietnamese in general, uh, who would meet there uh, to be reconnected to each other and share news of family members or those in, in their hometowns. And then of course in, in La Vang, right? They have huge festivals around Our Lady of La Vang. And when I was there, certainly I met Vietnamese from the diaspora who attended this Congress, as well as non-Vietnamese who attended the Congress as well. So I was really touched by that. Uh, and then, of course, now there are many parishes named after her. So this is just one example of the one in, in Orange County. Uh, and then in Washington, D.C., there's also an altar for Our Lady Lavang at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. So as you can see here. So when I was there, um, so it was really cold. I just happened to be in the East Coast and I decided to go to DC. Uh, and I met these young folks who flew all the way from California to visit this altar. And I felt really bad. I was like, I'm only here because I'm nearby, <laughs> you know? But they flew all the way from California to visit this, uh, the altar for Our Lady of Lavang. And so then I asked them, like, why, why are you here? Like, you, you know, took that effort to travel so far in November. And they shared with me, well, Our Lady Lavang is very important to their faith, to who they are. It just kind of makes sense to, to visit. I, they didn't have, like, a logic or a reason, you know, except that, like, they just really love her. That's it. Uh, so I, I really admired that. And then uh, most recently, um, there's an altered a statue, uh, um, almost $13 million, a statue of Our Lady La Vang uh, in Orange County, uh, relatively new. And then most recently, several months ago, uh, where I'm currently living in San Jose, uh, Our Lady La Vang Parish uh, uh, was completed. So the older church was St. Patrick um, Parish. It got burned down. The community mobilized in order to raise enough funds. Uh, so this actually cost more than $40 million just so to give the context of how expensive this project was. Uh, it took them uh, more than 10 years to complete. Uh, and so it was uh, uh, right here, there's a this is a church right here. Uh, so it was unveiled. Uh, the, uh, there's, and there's a statue of Our Lady Lavang next to the church. And it was really hard to capture the picture because everything was so big. Uh, but there's a statue of her nearby. But so um, the, the, the new church opened with a new name, which is Our Lady Lavang Parish, uh, and it's based in San Jose. So this is just to kind of give you a sense of how ever since Our Lady Lavang became Vietnamized, and again, that occurred only in 1998, she has become global, and there's been so many initiatives around her, right? Where there's building uh, churches to name after her, uh, there's also artistic production named after her, which I didn't get a chance to, to put in the slides here. All kinds of events are named after her, and it's only not only in the United States, but it has you know, also transferred to other countries. So when I was in Germany doing work there, I was surprised that, uh, uh, you know, the, so the Vietnamese community there is, is sub, somewhat uh, fragmented, fragmented not, not by intention, but it's just geographically, you know? Uh, they're uh, spread out you know, throughout Germany. But ever since they adopted you know, this new image of Erle Lavang, you know, the community come together, right? And that's what they share with me. You know, so I, I thought that was really interesting. And most recently, I was in Israel, and I think uh, Professor Natalie Nguyen talked about uh, the community in Israel, and I had a chance to visit right before the pandemic, uh, in part because there's a statue of her now there. Um, and so, uh, and uh, when I talked to uh, several local Vietnamese there, they told me that, uh, you know, this statue of Aule Lavang, looking as a Vietnamese woman, in the land that you know the Virgin Mary, the Mary was born, really uh, represent hope for possible reconciliation across different ethnic uh, religious groups uh, in in that area. So um, uh, so since then, I um, 
Oh, by the way, yeah, so this plaque here shows you the, the, the names and locations of people around the world, Vietnamese people around the world, who donated to this project of having this statue of Le Levant in Israel. So I see, for instance, Gordon Grove, Spoken, uh, Washington, Australia, uh, Wichita, Philadelphia, Fountain Valley, do you see that? So these names are literally from all over the world, as you can see, right? And they came together to, to donate uh, to this project. So most recently, um, I realized I can't travel as much anymore. I'm getting older now. So I decided to work with a colleague in, um, in computer science and, and a former student. We uh, built a tool um, uh, in order to uh, basically scrape information on the website and, and find a geolocation of websites that that references Our Lady Duc Lavang in different languages, right? Not just Our Lady Lavang, but Duc Mère Lavang in, in, in other languages, and we're able to locate and map it. Uh, and so this was recently uh, published in an, an AI journal during the pandemic. Um, I was gonna show it to you, but the, the server is down, and so I can't show you the tool, but it's really awesome. You type in Our Lady Lavang and it, it maps it out for you. Uh, to, to, just to indicate visually that you know, Arle Lavang is literally all over the world, basically. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about my research. Um, so I'll just edit there, uh, and then uh, I'll move over to uh, our next presenter, or should we, yeah, okay, right, that's right, okay. So uh, our next presenter, right, okay, thank you. So our next presenter is Mr. Jong Fan, who is the president of the Vietnamese community of the USA in Dallas, Texas, who will talk about Vietnamese Catholics. I think uh, Dr. Tung Vu uh, picked the wrong guy to talk about religion. I'm not religious at all. <laughs> well, uh, I think later on Mr. Nguyen will talk about uh, raising a Catholic youth. So uh, I'm raising three right now. And I'm telling you, uh, this can go to the opposite, opposite direction. I have uh, my boy. Uh, about years ago, he decided not to go to Sunday Mass anymore. So my wife went and talked to the priest, you know, and, uh, and then for some reason, six months ago, he went back to church. So the priest is so excited, you know, at the end of the, the Mass, he announced to the whole congregation, say, welcome back, Chris. Chris left the church for good, I, I, I bet. He never talked to me again. But, well, maybe next year, let's pray for him. And uh, my daughter is going to the other direction, right? He, she went to University of Dallas as a Catholic uh, undergrad. And right now she's working on her graduate degree at uh, Franciscan, another Catholic college. And uh, about six months ago, too, he called me, she called me, she said, Dad, you didn't raise me as a Catholic. You didn't teach me anything at home. I say, oh my God, I sent you to high, Catholic high school, you know, college, Catholic college, now you're going to San Francisco. And by the way, this semester the bill is $6,250 I haven't paid. And she, she answered me really cold. She said, you forget to count $250. $3,000 the trip that I will go to Italy this summer. <laughs> well, it's fun raising kids, but let me tell you a little bit about myself as a Catholic. I uh, was born and raised in Vietnam, of course, and um, I went to the Paris, the same Paris that my father went and found as one of the founding members when he migrated from North Vietnam to Saigon. And, uh, as Catholic, they indoctrinate you when you're really young, right? You go to all kind of religious training, uh, first communion, confirmation, Catholic youth activities, and uh, on and on and on, until one day is uh, the falls of Saigon. I'm 14 years old. And uh, I have kind of a similar experience that some of you have shared. I live right on Chiu Ming Yang Street, and on that very day, when the North Vietnamese force marching into the centers of Saigon, I'm on the balconies of my father's house. And looking down on the street, you can see the 
Vietnamese airborne kind of retreat. And then an hour later, a rows of tanks, T-54, marching on Chiu Minh Yang Street to head to Yin Dok Lập and somewhere else. And uh, here we go. At that night, I don't know what happened. I'm 14 years old, and I see that my father and all his friends, my father didn't decide not to leave Vietnam because my grandparents is, is older, and they decide not to go. And my father is the older son, so she, she decide, he decided to stay. So that night, I remember he opened the collection of Hennessy's, you know, Jack Daniel, Black Label, whatever, and they all drink it all. So I know that, hey, something really bad will happen. And it is, it was. Uh, slowly, systematically, they took away everything my father owned. He's a small business, growing from a small business and become very successful. Eventually, he owned a hotel with four of his friends, contracted US Air Force as a visiting officer quarter, right on Chu Minh Ki, very near to Nga Ba Ong Ta. And because of that, they treat my father as the enemy collaborator. They took away everything my father owned, and they tried to kick us out of the house and send us to economic zone. But my father said that if I leave Saigon now, I never have a chance to get out of the country. So he fought back. He stayed, and we fight a way to leave the country. However, during this time, church is our shelter, where we find peace, where we find information, where we find people that help us to leave the countries. And I didn't know that back then. I just, you know, I guess you grew up in that situation. You thought that that is something we'll, you know, given until we successfully uh, get to Singapore, right? Once again, as a teenager, I found comfort in church, where every night I found warm meal, uh, warm meal, where I find when I miss home, I can talk to the nun and everything. But those are the two that I didn't know that have been, you know, instilled on me since I was young. And that those, you know, the, uh, the sense of responsibilities, uh, the leadership training that, that I received, the servant leadership style that the priest at the church installed on me, all of that helped me to get through and build my own resilience. And I didn't know that until in 2005, when I see the whole communities, that the whole Catholic communities that being, you know, survive because that re the resiliency that, that they have built as a communities. In 2005, August, I work at Kelly Air Force Base, right? I'm a, I lead a, an engineering team and every morning, we show up at the staff meeting. My colonel, the first thing he asked me, can you speak Vietnamese? I said, yes, sir. He, he sent me to Hangar 18 that I still remember now. You know, Kelly Air Force Base is where they repair C-5 carrier, the biggest aircraft. They use that to evacuate a lot of refugee when Katrina hit New Orleans. They bring them to Singapore, and they bring them to Kelly Air Force Base. And they, they asked if I can be a translator so the social worker can work with about 10 Vietnamese family there. So at the time, I also a social chair of the Vietnamese American community in San Antonio. I'm a, also a secretary. So I said, wow, what an opportunity for us to serve, right? So we make friends with this 10 family. And eventually, we convinced three, fam three families resettle in San Antonio. And we go out and rent three different apartments for these three families for the whole years. It's getting so well. Every weekend, we gather people, take them to a local restaurant where we cook them Vietnamese meal. They so enjoy it, and they start to find a job. And then on, the, uh, on six week, those three families invite the Vietnamese American Council to their home. And when we show up, there's meal, right? Prepare, we eat and everything, and we look around, look like they're packing. Yes, they decide to leave San Antonio and go back to New Orleans. Remember, this is the six or seven weeks after Katrina hit New Orleans. They decide to come back, we don't know why. 
And that's the reason that I, I would like to bring up this, that story. Let me see. This is the, the story of a Catholic community has survived because of the resilience too that they have been provided, they have been brought up. And I know that Joseph, and I talked to a lot of people who have researched about this. In, uh, in 1975, Archbishop uh, Hannon visited, I think, Fort Chaffee at the time. He met a Vietnamese priest, and he met a couple of Vietnamese family in that refugee camp. And later on, he thought about, why don't we bring a lot of Vietnamese to New Orleans? And he contacted the priest. And he started to bring about 1,000 Vietnamese family to New Orleans, right? And in, in about 1990, that community growing to 5,000, with 75% of them are Catholics. And uh, at the time, about in 1999, their average income is about $32,000 a household. I think with the American standard back then, it's still okay. It's not high, it's low. But, but the way that they organize a parish is very, very interesting. It's just like a village in Vietnam. They divide it in branch. Every branch have a guardian saint name. They have a branch leader. So it's like a very well-structured, organized community. And after 20 years, in, in, 2005, Katrina hit New Orleans. This is their story. In August 29, 2005, Katrina hurricane hit NOLA and put most of the city underwater. And according to the data that we have now, there's about 1,400 bad, indirect or direct, right? And the Homeland Security have declare Katrina is one of the worst catastrophe happened in the U.S. history. Mary Queen Paris systematically prepared for the evacuation a couple of days before. And when they decide to move, look like every member on, of the Paris have the job involved in how to move their people somewhere else, to Houston, to Dallas, or use the government transportation that I met in San Antonio. And uh, the priest decide to stay behind with some people who choose not to leave or who cannot leave. And five weeks later, the first group of the Vietnamese American, about 300 people came back to that, to that parish. And during this whole process, Father Vien, I met him, he always keep in contact with everyone, you know, in Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and he told me some of his parishioners end up in New Hampshire, and they, he keep in, in contact. So going back to these 300 people, they went back. They pitched the tents, and with our government assistance, they rebuilt, they got out the, the damaged part of the house, they rebuilt it. And, you know, Mary Queen Paris is the, one of the first communities restored with our U.S. government help. And, you know, when you build up a community, water and, and electricity is really critical. But those companies, they will not connect those resources, if you don't have enough sufficient numbers of people who want it. So Father Vin, it within one day, he got 500 applications apply for water and electricity. And of course, they provided to them. And during this process, they become somewhat a political force. They help the African American who share the area to rebuild their community. And because of this relationship, both communities worked together to stop a landfill bill in, uh, in 2006. They do a lot of good things. And in 2007, city of New Orleans have uh, announced that they rank Mary Queen Paris 
is among one of the 17 community that will be funded by the city for other development because the, 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 they provide kind of return of investment for the city. So the city willing to invest in them. So I look back to my own personal experience and look back to Mary Queen Paris. I ask how those people have the kind of tool, the kind of ability to survive the adversity that threw at them. And that's take me back to the his, somewhat the history of the Vietnamese Catholic Church. If you can see the first block from that way, from uh, the years of persecution, there's about 130,000 to 200,000 Vietnamese was executed by the Nguyen dynasty. And if you look at this period, the Vietnamese Catholic, I mean, the, the Vietnamese Catholic communities have about 200,000. That means half of our population is gone by persecution. This is such a tragic experience, but we survive. And look at the following, 1945 to 1954, communists took over North Vietnam, right? At first, the Catholics support them because they think that this guy bring independence, they fight with the French, but later on when the, fa when the Catholic community knows about Ho Chi Minh intention, we decide to build our own army at Bui Chu and Pháp Diệp to protect our own parish. And when we lost in 1954, we mobilized almost the whole community to leave Vietnam. If you look at the, uh, the data of one minute? <laughs> okay. okay, can I have two? Uh, well, those, you can see the slide, you know, uh, basically you can see that there's a lot of uh, adversity uh, that the Catholic community faced. And I think of those have helped to strengthen our ability to survive, the resiliencies that build by our own collective experience. Anyway, if you look back now, under a lot of persecution that, that you see in the previous slide, Catholic Church is the only church have no state control Catholic uh, Church. Uh, this is to me is great accomplishment for the Catholics. And, and uh, like I said, there's a lot of reason, but I would like to use this uh, forum to call for action as an activist, okay? U.S. Commission of International Religious Freedom is an independent bipartisan U.S. federal government commission that created by the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act that monitor the universal right freedom of religion everywhere, right? And USERP, as we call them, use inter, uh, international standards to monitor any viol uh, religious violation. And they compile an annual report. And that annual report will be provided to the US president, to the US Congress, to the State Department. And in 2000, this year, 2023, USERP recommend the U.S. Department of State designated Vietnam a country of particular concern. Why? Because they violate religious uh, violation, including systematic, ongoing, and serious. Those are the three, three ways that we can measure that violation is very, very serious. And if you look at the freedom of religion, that's, that basically related to all human rights. The right, to exp the right for expression, the right to work and education, the right to life and liberty. In 2022, the US Department of State placed Vietnam on special watch list, as I mentioned yesterday. And Vietnam was first designated on uh, special watch list since 2005. 
then it was, that's when Vietnam was named countries of particular concern. So 18 years, that's not much improvement. That's not much improvement. And you know, USERP is, is a collection of a lot of scholars like you. They don't look at the report likely. They studied it in depth. But the key thing is, how do we teach those people in Vietnam to report the violation? That's where the activist role come in. We teach them how to do that. We teach them how to send us the core data, picture, information, and we write a format that, we, that can satisfy user uh, requirement for a violation report. And that's how we put the, that's how we force the user to have that recommendation to U.S. President. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm running out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Fan. And up next, we have Mr. Valt Han Yen of the Kaodai Foundation and executive producer of Vietnamese American Television based in DC. Mr. Trao Phan, I heard a document about the Kaodai just sent me 20 acres in Vietnam were hijacked by the Communist Party. Uh, we communication daily with the Vietnamese um, people in Tainan because Tainan, that the focus, that the most of the Kaodai live in Tainan. Even right now, we know it's in the world. By the book, this one, we have about 8 million Vietnamese believe in Khao Dai Lin, and uh, we practice uh, Khao Dai. It's not easy. It's too complicated for the youth. You can listen to this one. This is very important one for me. But anyway, the Khao Dai uh, stopped in Vietnam in 1926. By that time, the war between the Vietnam and French and Viet Minh. Later on, in 1930, the communists had come to the south. And by that time, the Khao Dai had to deal with the, um, the communists. That's why you hear about the Quân Đội Khao Dai. That's when Khao Dai have the school for army and train the people to fight back the communists, uh, even fight the French people. My life is not the not a happy story because my father, brother of my uh, father, and my grandfather, brother of my grandfather, were killed by the communists, by execute, and then put them in the well. So every year we have only one holiday for ceremony of the death of our ancestor. And we have to do everything at the well, not inside the house, because they die, and they put their head in the well. So that's not a good story. And even that, right after the communists took over the South Vietnam in 1975, everything belonged to Khao Dai, belonged to the communists in Tainan. In Tainan, they very, very much carefully about the Khao Dai people. And later, after two or three weeks, many youths like me, 18 year old, were executed because they claimed that the people who phản động. So make my mom told me, go to Long An, go to where this small place to stay. So I stay in the cemetery for three months to stay away from Tainan for my safety. And then after that, I get a chance to go back to Saigon to study. How I go back to Saigon to study? I have to make up my resume, my bio, because I have Dai number 13 priority to get in school in Vietnam. And my father worked for the government too. So I have to make up the communists call it Lilith. Lilith is very important for them. So I have to make up my Lilith to get in medical school for three years. And then after that, they found out my Lilith yom, yeah, because that's not the right one. So they call me to the office and then tell me, um, Stop, continue to go to school tomorrow and or give them three hours, go. Three hours, well, that time is, we can say we're for we're being very good, eh? But we have to love, we somehow corrupt them. And after that, I decided to get out of Vietnam and go to Thailand and later on come to this country in 1980. When I, when I came to the US, I asked people around me, there is any 
Temple Cao Đài, that means Thánh Thất Cao Đài, anywhere in Washington DC, you know what? No problem. Even I know many children of the very high ranking in Cao Đài live in Washington DC metropolitan, but no one them build any temple. So when I bought my house in 1990, 1991, my house was the first Thánh Thất Cao Đài in Washington DC. The first one. Many people were surprised why you give your house to be the temple. Because people will come to worship when funeral, they bring something to your house and then, but my wife Catholic, that's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife understand the situation and understand and she say, I die hard for cow die, so go ahead, do anything, but you don't believe it. If you come to my house, you stay with one night, and then you get out, you smell this scent of <laughs> something people burn in my house, and then you will feel like you're at the temple for a long time. But because my house is too small, only 900 square feet. I'm die hard for cow die. But that's not right there, I'm not stop right there. The cow die in Washington, D.C., is very complicated. One of the head is Trần Quang Cảnh. He hijacked our group of cow dai in Washington, D.C. He go back to Tainan, who connect with the people in high ranking in, in Tainan. And right now, you see many cow dai temple in the U.S. Get the hand of the cow dai in Tainan. They call it belong to Mặt Trận Tổ Quốc or Hội Đồng Trưởng Quản. For, for that, I believe it. The cow dies in Vietnam try to expand to the U.S., try to give more money, try to ship the people from Vietnam to the U.S. to practice cow dies. Because I believe it that easy to get in, get in the U.S. when you apply to do something for cow die in the U.S. Even you do not belong to cow die, you can make that application to state department will accept right away. And for cow dies, it's the one thing, but I'm the Boy Scout leader. I've been in the program for a long time in the U.S., many years. So I want to, the cow die have the backbone for the, the village, cow die youth. The cow die youth foundation, we call it Dai Dao Thanh Niên Hội, just like the um, Thu Di Thanh Thể, just like Gia Đình Phật Tử, but they believe in God, I mean of cow die, supreme place. And I help them to training and do a lot of stuff. The most important thing in cow die, that's community service. Community service, that means you do anything for your community. And Chị Thu Hà right here, one of the, um, the witness for our cow die used in South California, we do a lot of stuff, children festival, third community activity, whatever festival, you will see the cow die right there, the cow die used, but not lucky. Only in the city with how many cow die members, we see it, activity, but right in Washington DC, we don't see it. You have to have more than 100 family member of the cow die temple to start the cow die used. So, um, Right now, we have 235 members in, in the U.S. And um, my picture in the future is the, um, not too many people join the cow die right now, not too many, because the way is that I want to show you the way we practice it, not easy. Uh, many of us have to be at the uh, temple twice a month, uh, on the 15th or on the uh, first day of the moon calendar. So um, it's not easy, like the other religion, we practice on Saturday and Sunday. And right now, the need of the cow die, that's the cow die temple everywhere in the country. But that's not easy. We don't have too many members of our religion in the US. Estimate about 5,000 people, only 5,000 people. We have only uh, cow die in um, California, in Texas, Louisiana, uh, Tennessee, 
uh, cao đài in Boston, cao đài in Tampa, and uh, cao đài uh, in um, Washington DC. But the cao đài in Boston, the cao đài in Tampa, the cao đài in Washington DC, and um, the cao đài in Orange County were hijacked by the communists. They had, they, which belong to Hội đồng Chứng Quản right now. So in the future, maybe more. So that our challenge and warning, this is the opportunity, thank to Dr. Tường Vũ, I can spread the message. In the future, we will see more the cow dai from Vietnam come to the US. And the identity of the cow dai overseas will be replaced because I believe in the yellow flag. And you see the, the cow dai temple, that's different from the different religion. We all have the yellow flag of the South Vietnam. That's our identity. So in the future, if you don't see that many flags, and in front of the temple of Kaurai, that's when we're losing our battlefield and the communists will be here and overwhelm maybe a certain center everywhere, they don't let us to hand the flag. We value like identity. So right now, identity is number one for us. Good luck and we hope we have some opportunity to prevent things happen. Very, we, I call it a disaster. Thank you. And this is a book I read. If you have a chance, this one only thirty dollar. And I count it number number nine in this book. We call the population. Thank you. Okay. Up next, we have uh, Dr. Lam Quan Ngo uh, from the United B Buddhist Church, based in Seattle. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, you know, I uh, really thank you. Uh, Thanks, and I'm not sure uh, I should thank uh, Professor Wu for inviting me. The reason is uh, my knowledge is so limited, and he still uh, would like me to come and, and speak. And you know, uh, I was intimidated, uh, not only at home, but even worse when I come here, because, I mean, we have such a wonderful guest speakers. I mean, you're all scholars, uh, you have done such a great work uh, with the uh, community. And I feel like, wow, what I have contributed. So, but anyway, since I'm up here, I shall give you a little bit of my, and, and this is going to be quite personal. And it's like a journey uh, of, uh, up to now. And so how do I come into religion? Uh, because... Uh, even though growing up in a family who call ourselves uh, being Buddhist, um, but we we don't do I don't know much what is Buddhism when I was growing up, and because my family my parents are always busy uh, working uh, to make enough money to you know raise us, and so we only go to the temple or the pagoda maybe few times a year, and still what do you do when you go there? As a little girl, I just follow my mom, we bow, we eat a little veg uh, vegetarian meal, and we go home. I know nothing about Buddhism. And then we have a beautiful, my mom has a beautiful, I don't know how to explain, it's not embroidery, but it's just they make it with material, but it's beautifully made into a Kuan Yin Bodhisattva. I love it. But do I, what do I know? Nothing. And so, uh, so that's the first thing in my mind. And as I grow up, you have to understand my, where I come. I was a very uh, angry kid all the time. I don't know why. I'm always mad. I always contrary to my parents. I always uh, very, um, you know, I, I don't listen to my parents. My mom, she used to stay home to take care of us. My father went to work, and then we were always causing some problem at home. And when he go home, my mom would say, "This, this, this girl will do this. This one will do that." And then what happened? We got spank, spank, actually spank, guys. <sighs> do I get mad? In a way, not get mad at my father, not get mad at my mother. I know I should not get mad at my parents, but I still get mad. And do you think they can correct me? Uh-uh. 
the more they spank me, the more I hold on to my own behavior. I don't know why. I'm just, my cousin called me uh, Bà Trăng Lửa because I have a very mean, um, my, I'm always like blasphemy or something, you know. Trời ơi, đất hỡi, ông trời sắp sửa sập, something like that, you know. My mom, she's really scared. She believes in, in, in Buddhism, and, and the way they believe from now, what I have learned, is more like a superstition. And so from that background, you know, I, I, I don't want to learn. Uh, I, I always do things that are unacceptable. And my sister, my brother, they're not like that. So as I grow up, I just notice why am I so different? Why am I so being difficult to my parents? And, you know, although my, my, my father, he spanked me. He's the one that spanked me the most. Because my mom, she would not wear it because she's getting tired. She has asthma. So every time she got upset, she has asthma. And do you think, you think I love her? I love her, but I don't care because I don't understand. So um, as I grow up, my, my father somehow tolerated my behavior, even though he spanked me, but he still loved me. I'm the, I'm the, the his, his daddy's girl. That's what my sister always jealous with me, calling me my daddy's girl. Uh, so I guess because that, that probably increased my behavior. <laughs> you know, like a vicious cycle. Anyway, um, as I grow up, and I came here, and I feel like I have to do some change because I don't feel like anyone can rescue myself. I call myself I'm being rescued, so I decide to change. And but that that not going to Buddhism yet, nothing to do with it yet. Uh, going through life and everything, and I have done things that later on I felt like yes, I have followed the the path of Buddhism, but without knowing it. And I think that the, the, the first time that really uh, made me look into, uh, into Buddhism is by curiosity. I finished my medical school by that time, so I had more free time. So I start to buy books, I read. You think I could understand Buddhism? I read in Vietnamese, even though my Vietnamese is better than my English still. Um, no, I did not understand. So I had to find people to teach me uh, to go to the, church, uh, to, the t uh, to pagoda and ask the monk to, to explain to me. And so that's my curiosity. That's the first thing. The second thing that really made me look into Buddhism because I found that it gave me a lot of energy. You know why? You have so much stress treating patients. Patients that has chronic disease. Patient who has severe terminal illness, and, and, and they get depressed, they, get, uh, they, they don't know how to deal with it. And then you, seeing them, uh, you try to convince them uh, to take treatment. And a lot of Vietnamese people, they don't believe in the Western medical treatment. They, they think that uh, we give them uh, chemicals to poison them. So, so you have to explain a lot of things. And, and where do I have my, my patience, my, my energy to, to convince them, to explain to them? And then first, I get very angry. I say, why these people? I have spent my time to learn the best medicine in the Western area, and they don't want to believe me. Why? You know, I get upset. But then I, under, I try to understand. And I become, uh, I look at into their background. I learn where they come from. And you know, a lot of them, they don't know how to read. You think that they did not know English. No, they don't know even how to read Vietnamese. So even you have a translate uh, brochure instruction, it's no use to them. So you have to spend a lot of time to explain to them, you think you can explain it in the medical term? No way. You have to find the lay common term that they use. So I have to learn. I, I learned medical terminology in English. And here, I feel like I have to go back to school and learn the medical or the Vietnamese medical terminology. And not only that, the lay common terminology. So, so I, I have done that and I feel like, 
where does it come? But I learned uh, the compassion in, in Buddhism, the, the patience. Uh, you would like to help other people. You want to become unselfish because that you say, why do I spend, you know, I have to spend more time than all the doctors in my office to take care of my patients. And they want to say, you are supposed to only have 20 minutes with your patient. How come you take 30 minutes? And some after that, even after I'm done with my clinic, I still have to call their home to talk to their children, say, oh, your mom's supposed to do this, this, and that. And I don't know if she will uh, remember to take all these medicine the way it's supposed to be because on the label, what do you do? You even can write in Vietnamese, but they don't read it. So, so that's why I, religion helped me. Somehow, I don't know, but I feel like Buddhism has helped me a lot uh, to have that uh, energy to, to spend uh, extra time. And sometimes my, my children, they say, no way I will become a doctor. Because why? I stay in my clinic until like 9 o'clock at night when I'm done with my patient by 5 o'clock. Because I have to do all these phone call, I have to do all the documentation, and they are scared of me because they will not see my face at home. So anyway, uh, oh, I'm not going to go any of the other type of Buddhism, so no, uh, I, just, uh, I just put it there uh, for you to all know that, yeah, there's different type of Buddhism you can get into to learn Buddhism in different ways, and there's more Buddhism as a religion. So anyway, going to the next part, which I think that Ang, Ang Chow have taken care of, the part about the USCIF. Uh, because, you know, uh, Buddhism is also being persecuted uh, by the communist uh, regime. And so, therefore, uh, we are not allowed to have independent uh, pagoda. Even the, the Buddhist Youth Association uh, doesn't have, a, a lot of them has to incorporate uh, to be un, under the control of the, uh, the regime, the current regime. So I'm going to skip because I am running out of time. And I would like to go into the, the second, the, the third part, uh, actually. Uh, how do I move? Just move up. Uh, oh, we can skip. We we'll have to skip that. Okay. I go into the Buddhist youth organization. And because we are talking about community, and uh, we are talking about the younger generation, and the Buddhist youth organization has been founded since 1951 in Vietnam. And, and you know that uh, the central part of Vietnam has the most Buddhist uh, followers, and it has been spread, the organization spread to the south and uh, to the north uh, before uh, 1954. Uh, however, uh, after that, uh, we don't get any more contact uh, with the north part of Vietnam. Uh, so, uh, to make the thing short, why do I mention Buddhist youth organization? Uh, because uh, the, the traditional uh, pagoda, uh, when you go there, uh, they, they have a lot of uh, prayers for the adult, but they don't have any activities for the younger one. And not only, I, I would not like to, to say it is wrong, but I mean the, the prayers by itself doesn't change you much. That, that's not how I found about Buddhism. I actually learned the, the true, the core of Buddhism. And the core of Buddhism, you have to separate it from the mystical part, what I call the mystical part of Buddhism, to, to find the core. Because what it does, it changed a person. It changed someone to be truly honest. Because I believe in being honest, have integrity. Because why? As you know, in even like we are a very scientific mind in this country. And if, imagine you have all the facts and you, you manipulate the facts and you don't present it truly. How can you use uh, that study? I mean, I just used one example. And then you have to have compassion. You have to be unselfish. You have to reach out uh, for people. And where does that start? You know, among us here, all scholars, all people who have done so much, you are honest in yourself already. But I, going through my practice as a family, a family physician, I have seen families that not because their parents are bad, but because of neglect. 
or not knowing how to, to, to guide their children, they, they get into drugs, uh, they get depressed, they have suicide. And I even have a case that I, I, it, it hurt me. The, the kid commit a hit and something that I don't know, but he was persecuted by the law. And he got lost. He's the, he's the only child in the family. He was so, he, he got so lost. He hanged himself. He hanged himself. And it happened that people got there enough time to, to rescue him. But he became a disabled person. This, oh, I mean, it's a very sad story. And so I feel like if you can um, uh, build an environment for the children to come, it's a safe environment, it's a nurturing environment to help them. And even we have been called being babysitting. I accept that. Because the parents, they don't have time for the children. They don't spend enough time with their children. So we would like to be like brothers and sisters to help them, especially the preteen and the teenage period. It's a very important period. So I believe if we can change and make a person truly good and have a good self-confidence, they can make themselves better because they have the ability already. It's just the personality, the character needs to change, like myself. I think I have saved myself, so I feel like I can bring Buddhism to save the younger generation as a contribution uh, to the community. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ngo. So up next, we have Professor uh, Allison Truitt from uh, Tulane University. All right, thank you very much. Um, I know you may have a lot of questions, so I have just set my watch for 10 minutes. <laughs> and I would like to thank uh, um, Professor Wu for inviting me to participate today. Uh, like um, Dr. Sabrina Thomas, I do want to acknowledge that I stand outside of uh, the work that many of you are doing. Um, my, I stand outside of what might be called uh, heritage and ancestry. But I would like to say that my children have a Vietnamese father. And so I can understand some of the questions that you're asking. And I can understand uh, the challenges of what it takes to bridge the experiences of a parent to a child because of what I've seen uh, in my own family in terms of that. Uh, I do want to mention that because uh, I have my two books up here, um, and they're on display if you want to just take a uh, flip through them. The first one was based on work that I did in Vietnam, uh, Dreaming of Money in Ho Chi Minh City. And it takes its title from a uh, song lyric that people would often use, which was, last night I dreamed of Uncle Ho. But they would laugh and say, and Uncle Ho is money. So the book really explored the kind of contradiction of what does it mean uh, for people to exchange a kind of currency that they don't believe in. Uh, and so that was my first work. My second book was Pure Land in the Making. And it looks at Vietnamese Buddhist organizations on the Gulf Coast. And I chose that topic in part because of what we can think of as healing. I wanted my children uh, and their, fa their father's children to understand more about their heritage. That was harder than it should have been. I still remember when I would take them when I was doing field work, and they would say in the back seat, oh no, not another temple. 
So we had challenges there, but that was part of uh, the reason why I wanted to take on this project. But I want to tell just a story about my own, uh, another reason. And that was I arrived to New Orleans in July two, uh, 20, uh, 2005. And of course, that was the year of Hurricane Katrina. And we went to a Buddhist temple several times. And it was actually the leader of that temple who told us to evacuate. It wasn't my university. It was then a lay leader of this Buddhist temple who called us, who said, now is the time. You need to leave New Orleans. And we were, went to Houston and lived there for four months. Uh, and much of the information that we had came from uh, the Buddhists who we had met in New Orleans that we learned about information, we acquired resources. And I point that out because none of that knowledge that I had came from my own university. It came from within the Vietnamese community. And I think that is an important element of why religious organizations can be places of healing. At the same time, when I returned, uh, a lot of the mass media, a lot of the scholarship focused on the rebuilding of New Orleans and rightfully highlighted the rebuilding efforts uh, that were largely uh, concentrated in New Orleans East through uh, the Vietnamese Catholic Church, Mary Queen of Vietnam, uh, which we've heard about. And that was an important element, in fact, uh, but it wasn't the only story to be told. And so this was the temple that I had attended, which is nearby Mary Queen of Vietnam. You can see uh, from the membership board how many people did not return in terms of their contributions, their monthly contributions, uh, that they received some spiritual support from a Vietnamese monk from Dallas, Texas. But the resident, the female resident monk, was, was too scared to return to New Orleans and stayed in Georgia. So we can see then that that story about uh, the Vietnamese experience when looking at a different institution uh, of a Buddhist temple was quite different, but it was not often the one that was told. And so when people then uh, understood the Vietnamese experience after New Orleans. It was a Vietnamese Catholic, Catholic experience, which was uh, uh, well documented. But my interest in Buddhism was also, what are the other stories to be told? I would like to point out that when we look at the US Gulf Coast, it's important to uh, understand that this is uh, the kind of uh, vulnerabilities of the working coast, people who are working is uh, in the fishing industry, uh, the kind of uh, extreme weather from climate, uh, uh, climate change, whether we can think about hurricanes, uh, flooding events is ongoing. Uh, and so this framed part of my interest in what can be, ta what can be thought of as a very ritualistic saying, um, uh, about taking refuge, taking refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma, and the Sangha. And my interest is, how was that also a political statement? How, in fact, was taking refuge in the Buddha, taking refuge in the Dharma, and taking refuge in the Sangha, something which was political? And what I mean by that is the Dharma became something that was political, that Buddhist monks used the Dharma to explain and interpret people's experiences, people's direct experiences. This was not a teaching of the Dharma, which was rooted in 2,500-year-old teachings. This was something that Buddhist monks would take, and they would talk about the kind of struggles. They would talk about what it how to make sense of people's lives. What did a material life uh, what were the limitations of that? Where did suffering arise? Uh, and so this Buddhist uh, 
this taking refuge was, for me, a very political act. Um, we can see it in the kind of activities as well about building a hall, the kind of intense uh, investment that people were making in their communities, that the early history was often about repurposed buildings, uh, but during the time that I was conducting my field work from around 2013 to 2020, there was a lot of activity around building very visible um, Buddhist temples on the uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida landscape, in a sense to proclaim people's visibility uh, in, in an important way. But I also want to direct your attention to uh, a line from poetry by a, um, by a Buddhist monk, uh, Thich Ma, uh, Manyak, uh, who wrote these words in the 1940s and wrote this poem in the 1940s because of the kind of displacement and the kind of ways in which people were having to flee villages and the role that then uh, Buddhism played for people to have that sense of refuge. And I think that's important too because we've already talked about where do we find the origins uh, of what we want to think of as a Vietnamese American experience. Now this is a song that's often used to celebrate and to call on people to donate. So another one of the features that uh, interested me about how uh, building these halls was a political act was the way, in fact, that there was constant fundraising. There was constant fundraising that people would literally turn the uh, um, construction sites into places for concerts, that there was joy, there was a kind of, of there was food, there were festivals. Uh, and so when we think about Buddhism, much of that kind of activity would not be included within a formal study of Buddhism, but it was very much a part of people's experiences. So I want to end with another set of photographs, which uh, is about one of the things that we've heard about, and that was the figure of Kuan Te Um. And the figure of Kuan Te Um uh, serves uh, an important uh, role as a mother figure, that is, one who listens, uh, that one who acknowledges suffering. Uh, I know this is the work of uh, Tian Hung about looking at uh, holy mothers and uh, the question about whether one of the diasporic formations, which is important, is to look at that elevated role of the mother, which uh, you can see across these different religious formations. So as a means of healing and community integration, I just wanted to leave you with this image. All right, we have 10 minutes for questions before break. Uh, thank you all for your great presentations. I had a question about youth organizations uh, because we, growing up in Little Saigon, most of the people I know were either in Thuny Thang Thè or Yad In Phật Tử, or I don't know about any of the other youth organizations. Um, and a lot of times they're their own social group. Let's say my parents are Catholic. About 95% of all of their friends are Vietnamese Catholic too. And they, they stay within that community, and I don't know if they, they go in different places in terms of office or business uh, within that community, Buddhist community as well, and Gadai community. So I wanted to, to ask about what practices, uh, what, what are some aspects of daily life in each of the religions, especially for youth, that uh, play a role in maintaining identity for youth? Because most of the youth that I know um, uh, most of their Vietnamese identity is tied to being not just a Vietnamese person, but let's say a Vietnamese Catholic or a Vietnamese Buddhist. Um, and yeah. 
Uh, this is a question for uh, Professor Truett. Um, I was wondering with the uh, Guangtaeum, like, did you, maybe in your research, like, was there a similar process uh, of like Guangtaeum becoming more of a like revered figure within like uh, Vietnamese like Buddhism uh, throughout like time, uh, especially you know with uh, uh, Professor um, Hung talking about how the Lady of Love Island kind of changes, uh, and then. Is there like a similar process uh, that you see with uh, Guangtaeum? Okay, I, I can share a little bit about the uh, youth development because I'm, uh, I raised three kids, two boys and a girl, right? But uh, we don't, I grew up, my kid grew up in an area that's not, that's not a large Vietnamese American Catholic communities. So I know that traditionally, most of the youth like yourself, Joseph, maybe grew up in the Thiu Nhi Thanh Thai. My kid didn't. However, our American church adopt the Boy Scout. And we did have a Boy Scout troop within our church. So, and I become a uh, assistant scout master and my two boys become, uh, what is the latest? Oh, good bad. No, 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 not good, bad. The Eagle Scout, both of my kids, I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost that word, uh, become an Eagle Scout. But however, most of our Scouts, we welcome non-denomination also. But we did have some religious activity with the Scout if they choose to. So. I think in California, every time we have a third festival at Rende Bosa, you, you, you will see a lot of um, youth activity um, not even Boy Scout, I saw Thiu Nhi Thanh Thể, Gia Đình Phật Tử, Thanh Niên Đại Đạo, that means Cao Đại Youth. And um, I also see uh, many uh, youth uh, organizations like uh, Martial Arts, like Vovina, and the other group of the uh, youth activity. And sometimes, I, this, in the past, I proposed twice. We should have one jamboree for all the youth belong to different organization, and we can have the big jamboree, and that will unify, and that will show how strong. And maybe in the year 2025, 20, we will have the camp in South California, and many youth in different cities, different states, will go to South California to have the big jamboree to celebrate the 50 year we rode, the 50 year we escaped, uh, we live in the freedom country, and we can do something together. That will be the dream. And I have a connection with the uh, Father Bun in the uh, Catholic, and I have a connection with uh, many youth leaders in uh, Phật Giáo, uh, Hòa Hảo, and um, uh, Gia Đình Phật Tử. That's my answer. Uh, did, did I understand your, po uh, your question is about the daily activities? Like if like, like they're at home or something? It's very hard. Because uh, I don't think that, uh, first of all, uh, when they are so young, I don't think they identify them as a Buddhist. Uh, except for the fact that they do go to the pagoda. Because a lot of the teaching uh, it's very simple uh, to teach you to be a good person. Uh, the core of Buddhism is uh, don't, don't steal if it doesn't belong to you. Don't be greedy because that doesn't belong to you. And, and don't lie. Th those are the very fundamental that everyone will teach you the same thing. So they cannot identify themselves as Buddhist uh, followers. But as they go older, and if they accept, this is the part uh, of Buddhism, uh, like Dr. Tweet we, we shared earlier, is it's very hard uh, to bring the religion into their life. Uh, because there's so many things uh, in, in Buddhism uh, that is kind of uh, out of their concept. Uh, and and they, they don't accept it. That's the, the, the problem with Buddhism. And so we try uh, to teach them uh, just the level that they can understand and accept. And what we do is that there's one thing that I always uh, ask them, but I don't know if they do it or not, is because we have a, tr a 
uh, a custom when we eat a meal at the at the pagoda is we will um, mention the name of our Buddha three times. And why do we do it three times? Uh, because the first time is that we think of anyone who had brought the food to our table. I mean, from afar and from close. So that is the thing. So you do that. You don't have to wait until Thanksgiving. The number two is that you would like to do something good for deserving to eat, just like your parents they provide you with the food, the shelter. You have to do something to make them proud, to make it deserving, you know, for their sacrifice. And the third thing that you should do is that you not only think of yourself, but you think of others. You wish everyone would have a, even a simple meal, but they will not go hungry. So it's something that you would like to make them to do it on a, a continuous basis. And that way, it will help and get into, you know, it, it takes a lot of practice for us to do something even though we believe it. But we don't do it. We don't actually act in it. So that's why you have to ask them to practice. You have to remind them. And it takes a long time. It's a long process. I, take, I know the parents, after maybe five, ten years, they will come back, oh, we really appreciate what you taught them. But you know, for one year, two years, I don't think it makes any difference. So it depends on the level and how long that the, the children has gone uh, to. And it depends, and it really changed. There's nothing we don't teach, not, not all BOIO. Uh, doing the same thing. But that's my belief. That's what I got it from the core of Buddhism. And I would like to do something that will be more uh, to the children level. Uh, so that's at least one example. Thank you. Allison, do you want to answer the question? I want uh, one more input. Uh, for the youth activity, I know a lot of youth activity in our area in Washington, D.C. Uh, Cow dies. We don't have too many, but we have a lot of Vietnam Phật Tử, Thiếu Nhi Tinh Thể, and uh, Boy and Girl Scout. When the Boy Scout have their camp, we ask many youth, different organizations come to our camp. We contest, like a cooking contest, or, and then we have campfire, and then have a big game. We play together. We make a big family. So that two days and one night last for a long time. So we try to do it every year, and I think that's a tradition only. I think in, in, in Washington, D.C., that's the best, and I think in the future we can expand that kind of, um, and we're going to Camry or Jamory. We will have the Vietnamese kids with different religions can go together, even like, like I say, Vô Vi Nam and Karate Kid can come too. So everybody welcome to that kind of camp and activity. They love cooking and they love campfire, believe me. Big game is also that's the thing they want to do. Thank, Thank you. Allison, you want to answer the question? And um, very quickly, uh, I will say that many um, monks would say the easiest way to raise money was to do it in the name of Quan Um. And that's partly because, as, as a figure, this figure uh, which was culturally understood as a mother was approachable, that this was the name that people called often in moments of suffering, that people would talk about how in uh, when parts of their journeys as uh, crossing rivers on boats, they would call the name of Quan Te Am. And so the importance of that, that, of that figure, I think, says a lot about uh, people's journeys and why it has um, such salience even uh, today. Right. And, yeah. Unfortunately, we, we are way behind time, right? So we would have to go to, to Elwin for a summary and then uh, Tien Hun for a Vietnamese translation uh, or summary. <laughs> no? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, the undeniable importance of religion in terms of community, identity, histori history, politics, and spirituality. We heard today about the role of religion as creating and contributing to the historical context of a family, a community, and of a nation's stories, as provider of comfort and hope, as cultural and ethnic maintenance and connection, 
as a vehicle for representation, mobilization, and repair. We also heard about the persistence of faith and commitment to religion by different groups of Vietnamese in the face of various waves and campaigns of persecution and in the face of flight and displacement. We heard about religion as shaped by colonization, migration, war, politics, and changing cultural sensibilities. We heard about religious institutions as centers of refuge and comfort, community organization, organizing and services, and identity and representation. Uh, we heard about religion as a personal experience of understanding ourselves, where we fit in, and how we identify in the world. And just as information and culture is ever changing, is fluid and flows transnationally in diaspora, we saw that the same is true of religion, religious practice, and the role of religious institutions. Not only did we hear about the role of religion in creating and nurturing transnational networks, but also inter-ethnic, inter-racial, and inter-religious connection, collaboration, and support changing in a variety of ways to adapt and be able to address the needs of community and reflecting the changing relationship between those within the Vietnamese community, between different groups within the diaspora, with non-Vietnamese groups, and between the diaspora and those in Vietnam. But more than anything, we heard about religion as a manifestation of the enduring desire of individuals and communities to assert the importance of their faith and connection to religious institutions and practices through shaping how their faith is represented as with the Lady of Lavang, through utilizing religious institutions to help the community and as information networks, as with the Catholic Church and Buddhist temples in New Orleans and the Khao Dai Temple providing community services, services, and even as the backdrop to and vehicle for understanding our experiences and stories about ourselves and others, as with bu building connections, compassion, and actual buildings within Buddhism. Overall, we see that religion is both personal and political, about the individual and community, fixed geographically and migratory, based on traditions and ever-changing, a reflection of our own complex and rich experiences, identities, and perspectives. All right, I've got to try my best. I think, Quang, you, you put the high bar on this. Um, Chúng, tôi, uh, chúng ta đã nghe các bài thuyết trình về tôn giáo, đức tin, thực hành và xây dựng cộng đồng của người Việt ở hải ngoại. Tất cả những điều này là đều gắn liền với chính trị, lịch sử, văn hóa, xây dựng cộng đồng và chứa, uh, và xây dựng cộng đồng ở hải ngoại. Tôn giáo rất linh hoạt và có khả năng uh, thích ứng để vượt qua mọi loại biên giới. Tôn giáo mang tính cá, uh, cá nhân và chính trị và về cộng đồng luôn luôn thay đổi. That is it. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> all right, uh, let's take a five-minute break, all right, for drinks and stops and whatnot. <laughs> all right.